Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to Virtual Planetarium from the Museum of Science. My name's Janine, and I'll be your moderator today. This means that if you're watching us in Zoom, I'll be the one watching the Q&A box. So if you have any questions throughout the program, throw them into that Q&A box, and I'll share them with our main educator. We also offer closed captions, so if you'd like to see those, click on the CC button on your screen and select Show Subtitles. With that, let's bring on our main educator, Talia. Hello, everybody. As Janine said, my name is Talia. I use she, her pronouns, and I am going to be your educator today. And we are finishing our month of talking about upcoming missions that we're excited about. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about a couple of missions to the outer moons that I'm very stupidly excited about. And I'm so excited to get to talk about them uh, to you. And we are going to start off with a mission that's going to be launching in a couple of years and heading to Jupiter's moon Europa. Its name is Europa Clipper. So Clipper was, uh, you know, what a type of ship they used to um, that used to sail the seas. So that is why there is a ship on your on Clipper's mission patch. It looks like an old Clipper ship. Now this um, mission is currently under construction. So here are pieces of Clipper actually being built. So this is an, in the assembly phase right now. Uh, it's due to launch in almost exactly three years in October of 2024. And there's actually been a little bit of behind the scenes drama about the launch vehicle, the rocket that is supposed to take this thing into orbit. So it was actually um, passed by Congress that this spacecraft, Europa Clipper, had to launch on the space launch system, which is this one on to the left here, NASA's new rocket. Uh, so there was actually, you know, an act of Congress basically passed saying that this thing had to launch on an SLS. Um, the problem then became Project Artemis, the moon missions. They are pretty much taking up all of the SLS rockets well through Clipper's launch date. They're sort of hogging all the SLSs. And that meant there was no rocket for it. Clipper to launch on under the Act of Congress. So Congress relented, uh, said, all right, it doesn't have to be on an SLS. And so now uh, Clipper is going to be launching on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket. And this is going to be the beginning, uh, the launch is going to be the beginning of a five year cruise. It's going to take Clipper um, five years to get out to, oh, why doesn't that want to show? Oh, it's because I'm clicking on the wrong window. Hello, everybody, there I am. And here is Clipper. This is Europa Clipper. It's gonna take you five years to get out to Jupiter after it launches. So uh, it's gonna do flybys of Mars and Earth on the way. You can see it's got these big, beautiful um, solar panels to give it power. And it's going to enter Jupiter orbit uh, actually sometime in 2030. It is expected to stay there until uh, about 2034 is when they're expecting the end of mission to be. So it's going to form uh, perform somewhere between 40 and 50 flybys of the moon Europa at heights between 16 miles and 1,700 miles above the surface of the moon. And over the course of those orbits, it's going to get a look at the entire moon. So of course, every time it performs a flyby, it's gonna get a really good close-up view of a tiny slice of the moon. And over those 40 to 50 flybys, it's going to eventually build up a very complete image of the moon Europa. It's actually not going to be the only uh, Jupiter moon spacecraft hanging out there. It is going to be joined about a year into its flight or a year into its orbit around Jupiter by JUICE, the Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer, which is a European Space Agency mission. Clipper is a NASA mission. Uh, and JUICE's primary target is actually the moon Ganymede, um, which Clipper will be seeing. So Clipper is going to fly by the moon Ganymede and the moon Callisto um, while it's doing its flights around uh, Jupiter and Europa. So it is gonna get uh, up close views of those moons as well. It's just sort of a bonus because Clipper's 
as the name Europa Clipper suggests, Clipper's real target is the moon Europa. And it is going to not be orbiting Europa, it's going to be orbiting Jupiter. So if we swing around here, you can see here is Jupiter uh, and here are the moons. So there's the moon Ganymede, here is the moon Callisto, here is the moon Europa, this is Clipper's target. And you might be saying, well, what the heck? Why is it so far away? Why isn't it going in orbit around Jupiter? Why is it so far away from Jupiter and Europa at this particular point in its orbit that we're showing you here? But I want you to notice another thing. I want you to notice uh, this other orbit right here. This is the spacecraft Juno. Uh, Juno is a spacecraft that is currently in orbit around Jupiter. Its mission is to orbit Jupiter and figure out what, uh, use little variations in Jupiter's gravity to figure out what the inside of Jupiter looks like. It has been there since, I believe it was 2014. 2014 or 2016, it's been there for a while uh, and doing its mission, but you'll take a look at the shape of its orbit. Its orbit gets very, very close to Jupiter at one end, but then it spends a lot of its orbit very far away from Jupiter. And this is why, as we're looking at this position of Clipper right now, it's really far away from Jupiter and Europa. And there's a reason why these spacecraft have orbits like this. There's a reason why they're not up close in orbit constantly around their target, why they're actually spending most of their time away from their target and just sort of darting in to do flybys. And that's because Jupiter has a very, very, very powerful magnetic field. Jupiter is powerful in many ways. It's gravitationally powerful, obviously, because it's so massive. It's also got a very, very strong magnetic field. And that magnetic field actually traps and accelerates particles from the solar wind. So our sun is giving off particles all the time. And, uh, you know, they, they swarm around Earth's magnetic field. They're what cause the, the northern and southern lights here on the Earth. And at Jupiter, they can get trapped in the magnetic field. They get trapped in Earth too, but Earth is not nearly as powerful as Jupiter. And they cause, belts of radiation around Jupiter. Now Earth has them too, you may not know. Earth is surrounded by belts of radiation that we call the Van Allen belts. Um, we mostly don't notice them. They're not nearly as strong as what's happening out at Jupiter and we're pretty well aware where they are uh, and we keep our spacecraft out of them. So the problem for us here is that Jupiter's belts, radiation belts, they are 20 times as powerful as the ones at Earth. So that is a lot of radiation. And unfortunately, Europa orbits within the most intense part of these belts. Europa's orbit right here is right in the middle of the most intense part of Jupiter's radiation belts. Radiation levels at Europa, if there was a human on Europa, the radiation levels would uh, prove fatal to that human within a day. So very high radiation levels. That is a recipe for deep fried spacecraft. So that is why Juno does not spend time in or close orbit around Jupiter. It's why Clipper is going to be making these long looping orbits and just sort of darting in, spending a little bit of time close to Europa and then darting back out. And even then, Clipper has to be built out of radiation tolerant parts. And it's carrying special radiation shielding to shield its instruments against this ridiculous radiation from uh, ultimately from the sun that gets trapped around Jupiter. So, and again, that is something that we see happening on the earth as well. It's just, uh, or outside of the earth, around the earth as well. Uh, it's just not as noticeable, but there's a reason why they have orbits like this. So that is a lot of effort to get to Europa, right? We're building a spacecraft or putting it aboard a huge rocket. It's gonna take five years to get there. We have to build it special to withstand the radiation. So what makes Europa so terribly worth it? Well, let's go take a closer look at it. And here we are on the nighttime side where it doesn't look like much. So let's swing around to the daytime side. Oh, it doesn't have a daytime side at the moment because it is in eclipse. It's right behind <laughs> Jupiter. So it is actually eclipsed by Jupiter. We're gonna run time back so that we can get some sunshine on Europa. There we go. 
So yes, these moons do go into eclipse. They do go into uh, Jupiter's shadow. Jupiter's shadow is pretty big. So here is the moon Europa. It doesn't look a whole lot like our moon. It does have a couple of craters, but like our moon is covered in craters. Um, this is the, this is smaller than our moon, but only by a little. So this is the sixth largest moon in the whole solar system. Our moon is the fifth. Um, this one takes th only three and a half days to orbit Jupiter. Our moon takes uh, about a month to orbit the Earth. So Europe is moving pretty fast. And the difference between it and our moon is what makes it fascinating. What we're looking at here is uh, not a crust of rock like we see on our moon, we're seeing a crust of ice because Europa's outer layer is ice. And we think that ice shell is about 10 to 15 miles thick. We think there are other ideas where maybe there are places where it's only a couple of miles thick. We're not 100% sure how thick that ice shell is. What is most fascinating to us though is not the ice shell, it's what's underneath an ocean. We believe there is an ocean under the surface of Europa, um, probably maybe 40 to 100 miles deep. So pretty deep, like Earth's oceans are a few miles deep, a couple of miles deep. I think you can get as deep as like six miles. This ocean under the surface of Europa is probably 40 to 100 miles deep. We think there is more liquid water under the surface of Europa than there is on the surface of Earth. It may have geysers. It may actually be shooting bits of that ocean out into space here and there. We're not sure. We know that that happens on one of Saturn's moons, Enceladus, which also has an underground ocean. Um, we're not sure if Europa does that. We'd really like it because it makes it much easier to learn about the ocean if you, know, you don't have to get through the ice crust first. And it is one of three moons of Jupiter that we think have this underground ocean. We think Ganymede and Callisto do as well. So then the question becomes, why are we going to Europa and uh, not to Ganymede or Callisto? Well, uh, there's a couple of reasons. For one, Europa's uh, ocean is fairly close to the surface. Like I said, 10 to 15 miles under the surface, maybe less, we're not 100% sure. And that actually means that surface radiation, which of course is problematic for our spacecraft, it's going to be helpful in getting oxygen into the ocean. Now, obviously we really want to go to Europa because if there's liquid water, liquid water is one of the key conditions for life. It's not the only thing life needs though. So what we want to know is, does this ocean have the other things? And being close to the surface means that Europa's ocean probably can get oxygen into it. That's going to be pretty important for it to be able to support life. Uh, unlike Ganymede and Callisto's oceans, which are actually hundreds of miles deep, so not a great obvious way for them to get oxygen inside of it. And we also think that on Europa, as you can see here, the bottom layer of the ocean, the bottom of the ocean is actually resting directly against the rock of the moon. Uh, and that is very, very good for getting things like minerals and other elements helpful for life into the water. So we think Ganymede and Callisto's oceans are actually sandwiched in between layers of ice. And that's not gonna allow these very important elements to get into the water. So, uh, their oceans, Ganymedes and Callistos, are probably devoid of life. There's really not a lot of chance we think that those oceans could support life, but Europa we think could. Europa is actually, we have something um, that we call uh, the habitability index. Basically, if you look at our solar system and you look at potentially habitable places, so um, that includes, you know, not Earth. We know Earth is inhabited. So potentially habitable places in our solar system, uh, Europa actually comes in third on that index. So it's a place we want to get to know a lot more about. And um, that is why we are sending Clipper out there again, launching in 2024, entering Jupiter orbit in 2030, if all goes well, keep your fingers crossed. And we're gonna learn a lot more about Europa and its underground ocean. Now, I said Europa was number three on that list of potentially habitable places in the solar system. Before we go to talk about number one, Janine, have any questions come in that I should answer? 
Yes, we have one from Audrey in New Hampshire who says, five years is a long time to get to Europa. Will astronauts also go too? There is currently no plans to send astronauts to Europa or to Jupiter because it is such a long cruise. Uh, you know, we're having a hard time figuring out how to get them to Mars, and that's going to be a six-month cruise. So uh, right now, only robotic missions are planned to the outer solar system. For now, who knows? We'll see what happens in the future. And then we have a question from Regina that I think you might be answering shortly, which are, what are the first and second planets on this habitability index? Well, uh, only one of them is a planet. Second on the list is Mars which we do once think once had um, oceans on its surface and may still maybe still have liquid water under its surface in places we're not sure. Uh, we used, we're not quite as sure about that as we were, we used to be. So second on that list is Mars, but first on that list is another moon. And it is the target of the second spacecraft I'm going to be talking about today. So let's pull back and go visit this other target. It is in fact a moon of Saturn. We're gonna be talking about Titan. Number one on the list of potentially habitable places in the solar system is Saturn's big moon Titan. So here's Saturn and it's major moons. I do not have the minor moons turned on because there's way too many of them. But here is the orbit of Titan. So here is Saturn. Here is the orbit of Titan. Now, as we go and we look at it, uh, why is this the most potentially habitable world in our solar system? Well, it doesn't look like much, right? But one of the reasons it doesn't look like much is um, because of its atmosphere. So this is a large moon, large for a moon anyway. Uh, it is about the size of Mercury. It is slightly larger than the planet Mercury. So Titan is the size of a planet. Uh, it is cold enough and gravitationally powerful enough to be holding on to a moon. I say, or a moon, an atmosphere. I say cold, the average temperature on Titan is like negative 250 degrees Fahrenheit. So it is nice and chilly here. And it's able to hold on to a thick, dense atmosphere, a thick nitrogen atmosphere, which Earth's atmosphere is also mostly nitrogen. I know we think of the oxygen, but Earth's atmosphere is like 78% nitrogen. And Titan's atmosphere is also mostly made of nitrogen. Uh, on Earth, of course, we form clouds out of water vapor. On Titan, we uh, they form thick, 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 dense clouds out of methane and ethane. So what you're seeing here, this is not the surface of Titan. This is the tops of the clouds. And this means that Titan has a methane cycle the way that Earth has a water cycle. So there's clouds of um, water vapor in the air on Earth. If you're in Boston right now, you can see water falling from the sky. We know that there's water on the ground in rivers and lakes and stuff like that. And the same thing happens on Titan. So we did take a look at the uh, surface. This is the surface in radar. And what we're seeing here are sort of rougher and smoother patches. Uh, Titan does have rivers and lakes. And up here, if I swing us around to uh, swing us into daylight a little bit, this dark patch up here by the North Pole, this is one of its most famous lakes, Kraken Mare, the Kraken Sea. And this thing is enormous. It is bigger than the Great Lakes combined. And it may be over a thousand feet deep. So this is larger than the Caspian Sea. It's larger than the Great Lakes. It's over a thousand feet deep. So when we say Titan has lakes, we mean it has lakes. It has huge bodies of water. Its surface is actually not bed rock. It's bed ice, uh, but that ice forms very similar features to what we see on the earth. It forms mountains, it forms valleys, it crumbles into sand. So uh, Titan actually has huge sand dune field, fields of dunes, just like we actually see on the earth as well. So Titan has some things about it that are very, very similar to the earth, but also very, very different. Um, again, the atmosphere is very similar to what earth's atmosphere was right around the time that life was forming. So this is kind of a way to look back in time and see what a very primitive Earth might have looked like. 
And uh, Titan actually, we think, has the ingredients for life. Like I said, it's number one on that potentially, potentially habitable index uh, for our solar system. That is, it has the right ingredients if life can survive on a liquid other than water. And this is what we don't know. Water is key for life as we know it, but maybe it doesn't have to be water. Maybe life could evolve and survive on liquid methane, which there's plenty of on Titan. If so, Titan is a better place to support life than any uh, place in the solar system, other than Earth, of course. Now, most of this we know thanks to the Cassini mission. Um, Cassini was in orbit around Saturn from 2004 to 2017, and it did many, many, many flybys of Titan during that time. And it carried on its back a spacecraft called Huygens, and Huygens actually landed on Titan. It is the only spacecraft ever to land on a moon other than our own. And here are some images. So on the top left, we have some Cassini radar images of Titan and a true color image of Titan. And then on the right, we have um, the photo that Huygens sent back from the surface of Titan. Now that spacecraft lasted a couple of hours. All right, well, Titan's clearly a place we want to know more about. We want to know more than we can learn from the like the two hours that Huygens survived on the surface. And we now know Titan has this very thick, thick, dense atmosphere. It's also way smaller than the Earth, which means it has a much lower gravity. It's about, it's less than the moon's gravity, in fact. So less gravity than you find on the moon, nice, thick, dense atmosphere, four times thicker than the Earth's. This is perfect for flight, for flying. And that means we're sending Dragonfly. I love this logo. I think this logo is so pretty. Dragonfly is a dual quadcopter or an octocopter. Now you might've been hearing about the helicopter that we've been flying around on Mars, Ingenuity. The first thing we've flown around on a world other than the earth, which is very exciting, but uh, there's a few differences between Dragonfly and Ingenuity. So here's what Ingenuity looks like. This is an actual photo of it on the surface of Mars taken by the Perseverance rover. And Ingenuity weighs four pounds on the Earth. Compare that to Dragonfly. Dragonfly weighs over a thousand pounds, or will, once it's built. Dragonfly is huge compared to Ingenuity. Ingenuity will also fly uh, a couple of hundred feet at a time, which is way more than any rover has been able to manage. Uh, for instance, the current record holder for the most distance traveled by a spacecraft on another planet is held by the Opportunity rover on Mars, which over 14 years drove 28 miles. So roughly two miles a year. Dragonfly is expected, here's what Dragonfly looks like, by the way. <coughs> Dragonfly is expected to fly several hundred miles over its two-year mission, so over 100 miles a year, or a three-year mission. And it's gonna have to fly autonomously we can't be sending it uh, signals the whole time because Titan is over a light hour away from the Earth, which means every signal we send to it takes over an hour to get there. It has to be designed to withstand the intense cold on Titan, that uh, negative 250 degree average temperature. It has to be nuclear powered instead of solar powered because um, Saturn gets about 1% as much sunlight as the Earth does. And then Titan's haze actually blocks most of that. But this thing is going to be able to observe things from the sky and then take samples on the ground as well. Um, it has to do all the communicating itself because unlike the Mars missions, there's no orbiter in orbit around Titan to relay signals back to Earth from the surface, which means Dragonfly has to do all the communicating itself as well. And um, this thing is due to launch in 2027, and you thought five years to get to Jupiter was a long trip. This is going to take seven years to get to Saturn and Titan. So it's going to launch in 2027. It's going to land in 2034 right here, right around this round thing here that is Silk Crater. Uh, that is right around where Dragonfly is going to be aiming. So... Yeah, we have a long time to wait for that one, but between the 
in the next 15 years, between Clipper and Dragonfly, we're going to have a way clearer idea of these kind of unique places in our solar system, places that once upon a time we never dreamed could support life. And now we think we have a legit chance of being places where life could evolve and survive. And we're going to know a lot more about them uh, within the next 15 years. I'm very, very, very stupidly excited about all of this, in case you can't tell. Um, so uh, Janine, have any other questions come in that I should try and answer before we finish? Yes, absolutely. Eight-year-old Taylin would like to know what makes a moon different from a planet. It has to do with what you orbit. To be a planet, you have to orbit the sun. There are some other things. You need to be round. You need to be the most gravitationally powerful object in your orbit, <clears throat> but you need to orbit the sun. If Titan was orbiting the sun, it would probably be considered a planet, but it's not. It's orbiting Saturn, and that makes it a moon. So it's all about what you orbit. That's excellent. Um, we also have a question. This one goes back to Europa. What kind of water is thought to be in its ocean? Probably very salty, we think. <laughs> we think it would be quite salty. And then we have a question about Venus. Um, someone remembered that Venus was found, uh, a Ven phosphine was found on Venus, which is um, can be a metabolic product of bacteria. So um, this woman would like to know, is life also possible on Venus? It's not impossible. We do think that Venus was once a potentially habitable world if you go back far enough into its history. And uh, the discovery of that phosphine is very intriguing. Uh, new studies have come out suggesting that there wasn't as much phosphine as that team originally thought and that it's quite possible that the amount that they discovered could be explained by something like volcanism. We do think it's possible that Venus is still volcanically active today. Uh, they haven't ruled out the idea of it being caused by life. Uh, but it would have to be a very, very sort of special kind of life because Venus is a really lousy place to survive. It's extremely hot. The clouds are made of sulfuric acid. The pressure at surface level is the same as the pressure like half a mile deep in the ocean. So um, it's still not impossible, but recent studies have suggested more likely sources for uh, that phosphine in life. Yeah, I'm not interested on in taking a trip to Venus and becoming a people pancake. Mm. <laughs> not, not for me. Um, and Robin Lakeville would like to know if the craft that landed on Titan could have contaminated it with Earth life forms. So that is one of the things we worry about uh, with landers, because of course we're not as much worried about it with Europa Clipper because it's not going to be landing on Europa. But anything that we're going to land on another moon or planet, especially if we think that place might have life, NASA actually goes through a very strict uh, decontamination routine. These things are built in clean rooms. They try to keep it from, keep any earth bacteria from being introduced to it in the first place. And they do decontaminate it before they package it up and they put it in the rocket, specifically because they don't want to transfer earth bacteria to these places if we can possibly help it. Um, if we do discover life out there, we want to make sure that we didn't bring it with us from Earth. We'd really like to know if it's Titanian or European life. Yeah. Um, and then six-year-old Connor would like to know, um, do we know where the water on Mars went if we found signs so much evidence that it used to be there on the surface? Yes we do think we know what happened to it. So remember I was talking about magnetic fields. Um, Mars used to have one. It no longer does. Uh, that is caused, you know, on rocky worlds, it's caused by uh, having a molten core, which Earth has, and which Mars used to have, uh, doesn't anymore. It has a solid core now, which means it no longer has a magnetic field. And one of the things our magnetic field does for us is it does protect us from the solar wind, that same thing that's causing the radiation belts around Earth and around Jupiter. Uh, if you don't have a magnetic field, it starts to strip your atmosphere away. And that's what happens at Mars. Mars used to have a very thick atmosphere. It now has a very thin one. It's too thin for water to remain a liquid at the surface. You need a certain amount of pressure to keep water a liquid. 
So, and it makes it very cold because atmospheres also act like blankets. So with that very thin atmosphere, all the water on Mars either evaporated away into space or was frozen into ice, either both on the surface and under the surface. So that's where we think all the water went on Mars. All righty, well, I think that's all we have time for today. Um, I wanna thank all of you in the audience for joining us and sharing your questions and comments and thoughts. I hope you learned something. I'll let Talia say anything she might want to say. Bye. Thank you for your questions. Um, and once again, thank you so much for joining us and we hope that we'll see you again soon.